Welcome back to the Tin Dog Podcast. This time we'll be talking about Tom Baker's seasons. Now I know we did this last time, but that was only the first half. This is the second half of the Tom Baker Overview. Part 2, if you wish. So, we left off at Talons of Wang Chai Yang. Very good story, well worth seeing. I believe I gave that one a 9. It could be worth more. It is well worth seeing. It goes on a bit. You're kind of sitting there going, couldn't you fit this into four? It's got a lot of backstory, a lot of other things. Well worth doing. Remember, of course, you can contact me on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. And, of course, feel free to visit our website and leave some comments. www.tin-dog.co.uk And, of course, we now have a donate button. So if ever you have some... Money, I can't bring myself to beg. I'm so sorry. I just kind of think I need some better equipment and I'm very, very strapped for cash. I apologise. If you've got any spare cash, please feel free. It's not a pledge drive. It's just a button you can press and you can donate if you want. It'll help me keep my bandwidth going and keeping the podcast going. I'm sorry. I was distracted for a moment. We were about to talk about Season 15. Season 15 opens with... A very, very nice story with the Rutans in it called The Horror of Fang Rock. Now, the Rutans are the villains who you'd never seen at this point of the Santarans. They look a bit like the inside of a Dalek. They look so much like the inside of a Dalek that when the program was on this year and the Doctor was in the sewers underneath New York in the Daleks Take Manhattan, or whatever it's actually called, when the Doctor picked up the mutant, I thought, ooh, Rutan. Yeah, the clue was in the title, Idiot Boy. Um, the Daleks in Manhattan, rather than Rutans in New York. Moving on, it, again, it's one of those very nice Doctor Who stories. Small cast, they're marooned, unable to escape. Something's killing people. Is it what's happening? We don't know. That is the horror of Fang Rock. Now, you have to remember this is 1977. Apparently, this is the era of Star Wars. Now, in my head, I am almost convinced that England didn't get Star Wars until 1978. Everybody else tells me this is wrong, but I'm sure we didn't get Star Wars until January. However, I was six. What do I know? I'm sure someone will email me. The Invisible Enemy introduces K9. I like K9, hence the name of the podcast, hence my love of Doctor Who. I was six, K9 and me, we were the right age for each other. I will not apologise for liking K9. Other people hate him. Tom Baker was never fond of him. But, moving on. The Invisible Enemy, K9's first story, not great. Not great, by a substantial margin. The Doctor ends up being miniaturised in an impossible voyage journey sort of thing. Very Asimov. Only done on a BBC budget. Ooh, stretching things. To try and take out the great virus there on Titan. I don't even want to think about it. It's not my idea of fun. Watch it if you will. The image of Fendal was the one I mistakenly, last week, thought was Mask of the Mandragora. Image of Fendal is that whole uh, Hammer Horror version where there's a nice stately home somewhere where they happen to be doing experiments with time and monsters and skulls and there are ghosts. It's It's got some serious influences from a lot of places. It reads well. It's a nice tale. It was one that I didn't see for a long time. I only managed to track it down on VHS just before I stopped buying VHS completely. I'm sure I bought it, watched it once, and then put it straight back onto eBay. It's a good story, but it is the sort of thing you kind of just want to watch the once. Now, the following stories of the Sunmakers and Underworld, I always get mixed up. And I think that says a lot. I know one of them concerns um, suns orbiting uh, Pluto, I believe, and there's some sort of mining operation, and it's got the guy out of Blake 7 who played Villa in it. But that's kind of where it's in. I'm thinking, you know, looking at the titles, that would be the Sun Makers. Underworld, I believe, has 
you know, these are the stories, the two stories in the Tom Baker Times that I really wanted to check out again before I did this show, but I am pushed for time. I apologise enormously for this. It's not much of an overview when I'm actually forgetting stories. So sorry about that. But these two just don't register in my head. I don't see them as classics. They're just kind of fillers. Which brings us to the end of season 15 and the invasion of time. The invasion of time, another Gallifrey story. Now at the time, everyone thought the invasion of time was a fabulous bit of text. It was really, really well done. It built up the tension. The doctor had gone back to Gallifrey. He was acting extremely oddly. Um, you thought he'd betrayed his people. You didn't know what was going on. There was some serious paranoia. The president gets killed. Um, and the doctor, to avoid being prosecuted for that, it, it's... Well, no. It, the doctor ends up becoming president of Gallifrey and running the place. It's, it's extremely well done. And then you find out that the people actually invading Gallifrey aren't actually the people invading Gallifrey. They're just the bridgehead for the Suntaran invasion. The Suntarans end up... It, it's a wonderful story at the time. However, it just feels a bit clunky now that you watch it again. That's the end of season 15. However, season 16 all fits together. Now, American fans of the show will be very familiar with the Key to Time series because they were the only DVDs that you could get that weren't available in England. However, uh, very shortly, um, the Key to Time box set will be available to buy. All nicely remastered with a lot of commentaries on them. And if anyone wants to give me a copy, that would be lovely. I'm very, very happy that the key to time is coming out because they all fit together. The idea of the linked season obviously isn't new. I mean, let's face it, Tom Baker's first season is still linked together. But we are presented with a handful of stories that are all about a quest. And because of that, it makes the whole stories flow. Some of them are good, some of them aren't great, but they do fit together. Now, at the invasion of time, at the end, K9 is left on Gallifrey with Leela, who marries Andred. Now, for those of us who like the big Finnish audios, that story is continued um, in the Gallifrey CD collection. They're very, very good. However, we'd lost K9. But the closing pictures of that season were the Doctor getting the box of K9 Mark II out of his box, which was basically the same prop sprayed another colour. Or was he just the same prop with Mark II written on the side? So it's still K9, as far as all the kids are concerned. The Robus operation opens with the new companion, not just K9 Mark II, but Romana. Romana Varatnalunda. I've done that without looking at my notes. God, I rock. She is played by this point by Mary Tam. I say at this point because she's a Time Lord. She's played for one whole season by Mary Tam particularly well. They've apparently gone for all Ice Maiden thing. She's a little haughty. Eventually she ended up in Brookside, I believe. Which is odd, because Leela ended up in EastEnders. Moving on. The Robus Operation is a fairly standard robbery sort of episode. Um, of course, the Doctor is looking for parts of the key to time on behalf of a character called the White Guardian. Apparently the universe is out of joint. You assemble the key to time, you plug it in, the universe comes back into power, everybody uses the key, it's all lovely. Um, that's the plot. It's not particularly fab, but, you know, it's something nice to pin everything on. Doctor turns up, finds the lump of whatever it is, they move on. So, Robus Operation. That brings us to the Pirate Planet. The Pirate Planet, oh yeah. It's uh, written by Douglas Adams. You can kind of tell. Now, as a kid, obviously your memories are so much more vivid than the reality. And my memories of the Pirate Planet were wonderful. So when I finally got around to seeing it on VHS, I wasn't disappointed, but they weren't half as good as my memories had been. The robot... Let's look at it the other way. There's a planet that is a pirate ship. It materialises around other planets, mines them to death, and then materialises around another planet. It is literally a pirate ship. 
the man who runs the pirate ship um, is, well, you know, uh, is a pirate. He's half man, half robot, and has a robot parrot. The robot parrot takes on K9. It's just great. It's a load of not particularly good CSO, and the Doctor's... Well, it's a fun story. Don't take it too seriously, but I suggest you do it. For those people who've come to Doctor Who via Monty Python, it's worth looking at. Um, everyone's aware of Adams' work on Hitchhiker's Guide. There are lots of references. So, Pirate Planet ends well, followed by Stones of Blood, filmed quite close to Banbury, I believe. And it's a nice story. It's to do with stone circles. They did want, of course, shoot at, uh, at Stonehenge, but being the BBC, nobody gets to do that. It's stone circles, it's witchcraft, it's very similar to the K9 and Company story. It has an alien, it has talk of hyperdrive as prison ships. It's, it's a good story, well worth seeing. Sadly, however, it's followed by Androids of Tara. This is the Doctor Who does Prisoner of Zender story. For those of you not familiar with the Prisoner of Zender, it's basically, Hello, I'm the King. Hello, I'm a tourist who looks a lot like the King. Oh, your country's in trouble. Can I help out? It's that kind of tale. Not particularly one of my favourites. It's just something you kind of get through. Power of Kroll, which follows it, again, not great. But it does have a big wibbly-wobbly squid monster called Kroll in it, and uh, that camera work's quite well done. Some people say it's an allegory for British imperialism um, and our attitude towards things, places like India. You can read that into the text if you want. You can not read it in the text if you don't want. If you don't want to, it's about some people who are mining somewhere that they shouldn't be. And they're taking things from the natives that they shouldn't. So, in, in one sense, it's well worth seeing just for that. Power of Crawl is almost the end of the key to time. However, the Armageddon factor, or as I used to call it as a child, Armageddon factor, um, because it had far too many Ds for its own good, Armageddon factor is the last six-parter of the season. Finishes off the key to time, finishes it off quite well, goes on a bit, again it's a six-parter. It's not as enjoyable as you would think. Now it's probably, as far as I can work out, the last broadcast six-parter. It is, as always, split into two narrative parts. First four parts, the Doctor meets a princess who happens to be the last segment. Oh, I'm spoiling it, but you know, you're, you're doing reviews. It's well worth seeing. However, it, she is played by the actress who goes on to play the second Romana. Uh, again, referring you back to the Gallifrey and audios if you want to experience those. She would be ideal to return for the new series if they were bringing back more people from Gallifrey. I'm thinking that Gallifrey itself is dead. This is all my theories on where Gallifrey is and what's happened. But there's that whole Superman thing where a lump of Krypton floated off in Supergirl. I would like to think of Gallifrey as, you know that ball thing that you saw in the uh, the end in the last Time Lord? That ball thing could have survived. Uh, am I digressing? I would say so. So that brings us to the end of the key to time. Obviously, whether the Doctor succeeds or not, you can probably imagine for yourself. Onwards to the next season. Now, a lot of Doctor Who fans who were growing up loving Tom Baker, their memories kind of have either started by now or, or they're definitely in place. Destiny of the Daleks. Now, you have to remember it's been, what, nearly five years since Genesis? I know it was covered in the last podcast, the whole Genesis of the Daleks changing history. Davros survived. Davros is now taken back as part of the Dalek master plan. It's a lovely little story. Davros played by a different actor, I believe. Um, was it? No, Wisher was the original. Either way, it's a very nice performance. A lot of people aren't that fond of it, but that's only because they're comparing it with Genesis. Um, the Daleks are mining on a planet. Um, you don't know the name of the planet. Doctor feels, although he's suffering from deja vu, uh, Romana goes, deja vu, hui. Um, it's hilarious, apparently. Um, which is odd, considering oh, the whole Doctor Speaks Many Languages thing. Let it go. Let it go. Right. Destiny of the Daleks. I know you'll watch it. There's there's no reason for you not to. The Mavellans do have a bit of a, you know, fashion crisis thing going on. At the end of that story, Davros is, of course, captured by Earth forces. The Daleks are delayed again, and we don't see Davros for a little while. 
That, of course, is followed by, for what many people would now class as the best Doctor Who story ever, City of Death. Now, Doctor Who had kind of exhausted the whole aliens trying to take over the Earth, trying to do this, that, and the other. This is Douglas Adams' writing. It has a very, very, very similar plot to a Sherlock Holmes story and Douglas Adams' later work, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. There's definite links. Why waste a good idea when you can reuse it? Let's face it, it usually works the other way when it comes to Doctor Who. I don't really need to bang on about this. I do intend doing a full review of City of Death at some point because I love the story so much. The villain in this um, is Count Scarleone, um, a character, a creature called the Last of the Jaggeroth, who tries trying to take off in his spaceship um, in the primeval era of Earth. The engines went critical. He was splintered through time, thus he can exist in many places at once. And there's robberies involved. It's convoluted. It's one of the few stories that's actually got time travel in it where it works. So, Destiny of the Daleks, City of Death. Now, Creature of the Pit. Creature from the Pit, I apologise. Not a lot of people's favourite story at all. I really have no terrible issues with it. It wasn't a highlight. But if you asked me which one I'd rather watch, Creature from the Pit or Scribble Girl from 2006... I'd be plumbing for the rather rude-looking monster down a big hole any time. And, of course, I am not lying by saying that this monster really does look quite rude. This story has one of the best actors never to play the Doctor in it, Geoffrey Bilden, who everyone always assumed should play him. Now, of course, now that we've gone for a younger theme of Doctor, Geoffrey, I don't think, is going to get to play him at all. Which is sad, but he'd make a great Gallifreyan. Or, indeed, just some sort of strange man in time. He's played the Doctor in some of the audios extremely good. So, after the Creature from the Pit, we have Nightmare of Eden. Now, Nightmare of Eden, again, not a great story. There is a crash in space, in space, in orbit of a planet. Two ships collide. There is some scientists uh, possibly smuggling drugs, possibly not. Let's not give the game away. And there are some creatures called the Bandrills who look like characters from a glam rock band. Um, they're big, they're furry. Actually, no, they look like Guar. If you're familiar with Guar, that'll make sense. If not, look them up. If not, crash on, move along. We've got lots to cover. Moving on, moving on. Yeah. Nightmare of Eden, not people's favourite stories. However, it is followed by Horns of the Nymon, which makes Nightmare of Eden look like a Shakespearean piece. Yeah, Horns of the Nymon, it's Greek legends redone. Now, remember, when Doctor Who redoes stuff, it sometimes works really, really well, and sometimes doesn't. It's got some of the best overacting ever seen in Doctor Who. It's well worth experiencing just for that. Possibly not buying... The Naimon themselves, who are just giant bulls, or indeed men in tights, wandering around with big plastic heads on, are kind of definitively not particularly good Doctor Who monsters. They're the sort of thing that people who want to pick on Doctor Who will cite as an example of the BBC just not trying. The following story does not exist. Well, it does. You see, Sharda was another Douglas Adams penned piece. It was down to be a classic, mainly because people didn't get to see it for years. What happened was the BBC had some sort of industrial action going on. I'm sure you can find out the facts of that for yourself. But basically, Douglas Adams had written a story exceptionally similar to Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, the bits that weren't in City of Death, and... That story has invisible spaceships, yeah, and it also has... Well, actually, a Dalek makes an appearance at one point, apparently, but you see, what happened was they only filmed half of it. Many of the scenes don't exist, so when the VHS was eventually released with a script, it had Tom Baker sitting in a big armchair going, and this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and it's not great. It wasn't meant to be a six-parter. The video lasts, what... I would say an hour and a half. So quite a lot of it survived, but it doesn't 
have the feel of anything fabulous. If you want to experience Sharda, rather than dig out the Tom Baker version, which I know many of you could still have access to, does appear on eBay from time to time. It's never been part of any sort of boxed set or anything. I would not dig that one out. I would buy or get hold of the Paul McGann version of the same story with very similar cast, um, which is an audio. It's got some lovely acting in it. Um, definitely recommend that one. So Sharda, nice fourth Doctor story, but if you want to experience it, experiences it in eighth Doctor audio. That brings us to the end of that season. We then crash on to season 18. Yes, it's time for Tom to move on. Season 18 had a slightly, well, it had changed titles, it had changed music, it uh, had a whole different thrust. Science was being brought back into it slightly more, or what passes for science in Doctor Who world, and then we have some very nice stories. The Leisure Hive. You were kind of reeling from that whole, whoa, what's going on with the titles thing going on? We had the new music, we had everything. The Leisure Hive, the Doctor and Romana, still Romana, still the second one, land um, on, they're on Brighton Beach, uh, Canine blows a fuse, nicely removed from the story, well done. And then we move to the Leisure Hive, which is a little pla planet somewhere that suffered a war. It's got the Famazi, who are like little lizardy things. Um, basically, there's a post-destruction world um, who can't breed, and they've become a sort of um, Disneyland, but they experiment with tachyons and things like that. Not one of my personal favourites, but then again, some people do like it. It's followed rather oddly by Meglos. Meglos is a bit of a sort of... it's just an oddity. The fourth Doctor is impersonated by an alien, an alien cactus, who can change shape. It becomes the fourth Doctor in order to steal a dodecahedron. Now, if you're a fan of kids' TV from the 80s, the dodecahedron was probably something that Teabag would try and steal on kids' ITV. Or, if you're a fan of Dungeons & Dragons, it's a D20. Neither of which have enormous universal power, unlike the thing in this story, which apparently does. You're kind of watching it, you're going, lovely, but could you just do something else? Luckily for us, it's followed by Full Circle. Now, Tom Baker, we all knew by this point, the country wide, knew that Tom was leaving. We knew that Romana was going. We knew other people were coming on board. This story takes us from our universe into an alternative, not an alternative universe as such, just a pocket universe, a universe, um, a sort of alleyway universe called E-Space, Exospace. It's on the outside, very small. It's um, it's sort of it occupies the same space as us, but it's it's an extra dimensional space. That's how it's described. Kind of just go with parallel universe. Nobody will notice. So full circle was written by a Doctor Who fan, a Doctor Who fan who kept sending in scripts, and eventually they were accepted. That's the folk story. Whether it's true or not, we just don't know. Well, I just don't know. Suffice to say that it's a great story. A spaceship had crashed on a planet. The Doctor, Romana, K9 all turn up and they investigate what's going on in the ship. The Elders, who are everyone on board the ship, is the descendants of the original crash victims. However, on the outskirts of town, some creatures emerge from the swamp, the Swamp Men, I'm assuming, and they kind of raid this crashed spaceship. You begin to realise that there's other things going on. I don't want to spoil it, it's a nice story. Find it if you can. It was in a boxed set because there were three stories all set in eSpace. The second story is State of Decay. Finally, finally, the Doctor gets to deal with vampires. Has anyone noticed what I've forgotten? Has anyone out there noticed? Adric. Yeah, Adric is a new companion for the Doctor. Adric is a mathematical genius from the planet Alzarius, who was one of the one of the people on the crashed spaceship. He would left Alzarius, snuck on board the TARDIS, and travelled off. My partner did ask me some time ago a very good question: Why do people not like Adric? And I couldn't answer. 
were we jealous of him? I mean, let's face it, many of us were the same age or a few years younger than him, and this guy had got the job that we all wanted. Perhaps that was it. Years later, you replaced that with, perhaps he wasn't a good actor. Perhaps he was just too boisterous. I just don't know. But if anyone does know why we don't like Adric, feel free to email me. tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk I'm interested to hear your thoughts. If I get enough of them, I'll do an extra show on that. So, state of decay. Doctor Who does vampires. Oh yes, it's what we've always wanted. Apparently you get a bit more back history on Gallifrey. The great vampires who were hunted by the Time Lords in their great big bow ships. They've never really gone into, but basically they look like pointy flash golden spaceships in my head. You kill the great vampire, that kills the offspring. It's standard vampire folklore stuff, quite well done for its time. It's got some great moments. So, that's the second of the eSpace trilogy. Finally, the third and oddest part is Warrior's Gate. Seen by a lot of people, a lot of Doctor Who fans who I've spoken to in the past, as one of those true classics, but not particularly great, but overrated and then underrated. It's, it's a great source of debate, Warrior's Gate. The land in a place that's completely white, apart from this enormous tower, and the tower has access to the past and the future. K9's going completely insane. He's talking backwards. Um, there are some creatures called the Th Thralls. I think that's it. They're basically just giant bear, tigery people. Um, makeup's not bad. It's as good as the uh, Catwoman from the modern season. Um, so that's not bad. I mean, obviously, it's not as good, but I wouldn't say it was bad at all. Warrior's Gate is an oddity but it is well worth examining to show Doctor Who at its very fundamentals. Of course, by this point, we are running out of time for Tom Baker. Romana and K9 remain behind. Adric and the Doctor journey back into real space. The Doctor is very forlorn, very low, very dark. It's the beginning of a dark time. He has, however, got a very nice pair of boots on. And so we end up in the last three stories. Well, two really. The Keeper of Traken. Now, Keeper of Traken introduces a new companion, Nissa of Traken, and it also sees the return of a rather nice villain. Anthony Ernie plays Nissa's father, who is then possessed by the Master. Ah. Uh, now, all of these last stories are in the New Beginnings boxed set, which has only been out a few months. Well worth experiencing because it has Anthony Ainley's commentary as one of the extra tracks. It's lovely being able to experience in something like that. And so the Keeper of Traken makes way for Logopolis. Again, the Master's the villain. The Master happens to destroy a huge portion of the universe. This guy is just insane and evil. If ever you needed to question who was the most evil, they see the Daleks want to conquer the universe. The Master hasn't even got that going for him. He's just mental. And I mean that in the actual sense. Tom Baker, as we all know, wobbles on the top of the giant space telescope just somewhere outside Manchester, plummets to his death, and becomes Peter Davidson, some vet bloke. And hundreds of eight-year-old kids go, What? Because they had not experienced regeneration. It was new to them. They turn to their parents and go, Is this what happened last time? And their parents go, Shut up, eat your tea. Or in some cases, they go, No, no, last time there were spiders. Well, we leave it there and ready for the next time. So, it's about time I give my marks out of ten for the parts I've covered so far. Robus Operation, six. Pirate Planet 9, well worth seeing. Stones of Blood 8, interesting but good. Androids of Tara, 6, perhaps 7. Power of Kroll, 7. Armageddon Factor, I would go for 6, going on 7, but to be honest, I think it's a 6. I'm just not fond. Destiny of the Daleks gets a 9. City of Death, 10. The only reason the, only reason the Dalek story got a 9 was because it wasn't sitting next to City of Death. 
Creature from the Pit gets a seven. And I know that's going to wind up quite a few of you old school fans. Nightmare in Eden, again, seven. Horns of the Nymon, I'm sorry, I couldn't give it more than six. Even the campiness value doesn't let me give you more than six. Although, in all fairness, Horns of the Nymon did mark my return to fandom after a few years off, when I found an old VHS and went, I'll just watch this. Hmm, some things are just evil. Sharda, I would give an eight if it had been finished. Leisure Hive, six. Megloss, seven. Full Circle, eight. State of Decay, eight. And Warrior's Gate, a seven. Keeper of Traken, I'd give an eight. And Logopolis, a nine. Mainly for the emotional impact it has on you. So that brings us to the end of this podcast, the end of Tom Baker's time. Next time we'll be discussing Peter Davidson's time in the TARDIS. However, as I'm broadcasting this, I suspect Sarah Jane adventures are coming our way. What I'll do is I'll wait a few weeks and then review a few of them all in one go. Be seeing you. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. If you have been affected by anything discussed in this show, a helpline has definitely not been set up. However, you can email us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk or leave a comment or a picture at our website www.tin-dog.co.uk Dr. Ho is a registered trademark of the BBC and they'll come round and bite you if you misuse it. No infringement is intended.